Hello my schoolers, you're welcome to my school YouTube channel. My name is Emmanuel and today we'll be looking at chemical combination in chemistry. Please don't go anywhere, stick around and we'll be right back. Welcome back to my school YouTube channel. Like I said earlier on, we'll be looking at chemical combination in chemistry today. And under that, we'll be looking at laws of chemical combination, chemical symbols, formula equations, and their uses. We'll be looking at stoichiometry. We'll be looking at relative atomic mass based on carbon-12. And lastly, we'll be considering the mole concept and the Avogadro's number. Now, let's get down to it. Laws of chemical combination. In science, a law is a general statement that explains a large number of observations. Before any law is accepted, it must be verified many times under many conditions by different scientists before it can be ascertained and be said to be a law. Of course, under this law of chemical combination, we'll be looking at four laws. The first one is the law of conservation of matter, the law of definite proportion, also known as the law of constant composition, the law of multiple proportion, and lastly, we'll be looking at the law of reciprocal proportion. The next slide, please. The law of conservation of matter is also known as the law of indestructibility of matter. And what does it state? It states that matter can neither be created nor destroyed in the course of a chemical reaction, but changes from one form to another. According to this law, during any physical or chemical change, the total mass of the products remains equal to the total mass of the reactants. You know, on the left hand side, usually that's where we have the reactants, and then on the right hand side, we have an arrow separating them, and on the right hand side, we have the product. Now, if you look at this, we have mercuric oxide, HGO, that is the formula for that. We see that there was 100 grams at the beginning of the reaction. And after the reaction was completed, we have two products, which is mercury, which is liquid, and then oxygen, which is gaseous. You can see this. This is 92.6 grams of mercury, and then we have 7.4 grams of oxygen. If we add up the values for the masses of mercury and oxygen together, we should have the same thing we have on the left hand side. So when you had 92.6 to 7.4, we are going to have 100 grams. So which means that the law holds because there is no destructibility of this. We still have the product added up together to find it. So which means that there is no loss of any kind. The next slide, please. Look at this example. If eating 20 grams of calcium carbonate, that's a limestone, produces 14.7 grams of CO2, that's carbon dioxide, and 5.3 grams of calcium oxide, show that these observations are in agreement with the law of conservation of matter. All we need to do is, first, you need to write out your chemical reaction and show the equation. We have this calcium carbonate. If it undergoes the reaction, if it is applied to heat, we have calcium oxide and carbon four oxide. We are given the masses of each of the reactants. Remember, these are the products. This is the reactant. Reactants are always on the left hand side, separated by an arrow. Then we have the product on the right hand side. The mass of the reactant for calcium carbonate was given as 20 gram, which is this. And the mass of the products were actually 14.7 gram for CO2 and 5.3 gram for calcium oxide. So by the time you add up the two masses for the product, we have 20 grams, which is equal to the mass of the reactants we have on the left hand side. So we can say because the mass of the reactants is equal to the mass of the products that we have on the left hand side, the observations are in agreement with the law of conservation of matter or mass. Let's go to the next slide. How do we verify the law of conservation of matter? Regardless of how 
substances within a closed system are changed, the total mass must remain the same. That's how to show that we can. If you look at this, we have calcium chloride in the test tube here, and then we have in the conical flask, we have sodium tetraoxysulfate 6 inside of the conical flask. And by the time you weigh this before they are mixed together, you have a value here on the weigh balance. Now, we will now turn this into this to mix up with the sodium tetraoxysulfate 6 inside of this. That's what is happening here. So it is mixed up. Of course, there's a cork here so that it doesn't pour out. The content does not pour out. And after mixing up, we have this left here. We have inside here sodium chloride will be formed as one of the products and calcium tetraoxysulfate 6 will also be formed inside of this. Now, taking the, the weight of everything together, we still have the same value we had here before the reaction and this. So, it shows that the law of conservation of mass has been verified. That is the chemical equation there. You can see the reactants here, calcium chloride reacting with sodium tetraoxysulfate 6 to have 184.34 gram. That's when it is it was weighed. Then the product also measured together, we had 184.34. So the law of conservation of mass. Oh, so regardless of how many substances that we have within that closed system, the masses must remain the same, like what we had from the beginning. Let's go to the next slide, please. The next law we're looking at is the law of definite proportion or law of constant composition. What does it state? It states that all pure samples of the same chemical compound no matter the method that is employed in preparation, must contain the same elements and combined in the same proportion by mass. Let's consider a pure water. For instance, it does not matter whether the water is gotten from rain, whether it is gotten from the well, whether it is gotten from, uh, from the sea, from the ocean. A pure water will always have the components to be hydrogen and water. Remember the formula for water when we talked about compound is H2O. So we have two elements that combine together chemically, hydrogen, two moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen. So water will always have that composition. So it has a definite proportion. So regardless of the source of that water, on electrolysis of acidified water, it must always, always contain hydrogen and oxygen in the ratio of 2 is to 1. Let's go to the next slide. How do we verify this law of definite proportion? It can be verified in the laboratory by using two or three different methods to prepare the same compound. You want to prepare a pure sample of the same compound. So we use several methods. For instance, look at this method one. We want to prepare copper oxide. Now, we made use of two methods here. The first method, we reacted copper with triosonitrate 5, HNO3, and then we had copper nitrate with water and then with uh, nitrate oxide. And uh, the first product we have, we have this. This is our major product because we want to produce copper oxide. So we don't need this, we don't need this. So we can take this one. This one will now undergo further reaction. That's what we have here. And then we have our copper oxide produced, NO2, and then O2 produced. So this is our area of concentration. This is what we are after. We have, we have been able to prepare copper oxide in the lab. Now, look at another method to pre prepare that. We have copper triisocarbonate here. Now, when you eat this symbol, when you see a triangle underneath an arrow, it actually means there's heat. Okay, when you eat up this, we have copper oxide and CO2. At the end of the day, of course, this is gas, so it's going to be given off. Of course, we can still have that, you know, in a, you know, container. So this is our major product, copper oxide. Of course, it is copper 2 oxide. That is the IUPAC name, copper 2 oxide. So for short, we call it copper oxide. So we have copper 2 oxide here, just like this. Now, this is a different route from this. But the thing is that we have copper oxide eventually at this side. So pure samples of copper 2 oxide prepared using different methods contain the same elements we have copper oxide here we have copper here we have copper here we have oxide here we have oxygen here we have oxygen here so copper and oxygen will be what will be prepared eventually contained in that same element the same elements are contained even though it was the same sample but different methods that was used we still have copper and uh, oxygen 
in a definite proportion. So this shows that the law of definite proportion actually holds. Let's move on to the next slide, please. The law of multiple proportion, that's the third law under chemical combination. What does this law state? This law states that if two elements, let's say element X and element Y, combine together to form more than one compound, then the masses of X, which separately combines with a fixed mass of Y, must be in a simple multiple ratio. What does it mean? We can have two different elements combining together and forming different compounds. Okay, but regardless of the different compounds, they must be in a simple multiple ratio, the way they are fixed together. Some examples of paired elements that can obey this law are we have carbon and oxygen combined to form carbon 2 oxide and carbon 4 oxide. You can see we have carbon here and oxygen. We have carbon here and oxygen. But the ratio of this is ratio 1 is to 1 because we have one atom of carbon and one atom of oxygen here. Here we have one atom of carbon, then we have two bowls of what? Oxygen here. So we have two elements combining together. But the thing is, they must be in simple multiple ratio, the way they are combined. This is ratio 1 is to 1. This is ratio 1 is to 2. Another one is we have iron and chlorine combining to form two compounds. We have iron 3 chloride, which is a yellow substance. It is yellow in color. That is FeCl3. And then we have iron 2 chloride, which is FeCl2. That is green in nature. We have iron here, and then we have chlorine also to produce this. So, we have two different elements giving us different compounds, okay? This is ion 2 chloride, this is ion 3 chloride. So both of them, the same elements giving us different, you know, more than one compound. We have ion and oxygen also combining to form the brown ion oxide and then the black ion oxide. Of course, ion oxide for short, but this is actually, we have Fe2O3 here and then we have FeO here. So this is a reaction between ion and oxygen iron and oxygen, but in different ratio, they are able to combine together. So, the law actually states that if two elements, like any of these ones, okay, combine to form more than one compound, as we have seen in these cases now, then the masses of the first element, which separately combines with the fixed mass of the second, one of them must be a fixed mass, must be in simple multiple ratio. Let's move on to the next slide, please. How do we verify this law of multiple proportion? The method here, we can undergo that in the laboratory, okay, to make it easier. First, you weigh two clean crucible labeled X and Y, the first crucible and the second one, X and Y. Then you place a known quantity of Cu2O, copper 1 oxide, on the first uh, crucible, which is crucible X, and then copper oxide, you place that on the second uh, crucible, which is crucible Y. Then you put them in a combustion tube and then you eat very strongly. Once you do that, you'll be able to reduce them to pure copper by passing a stream of hydrogen through that tube. Once that happens, you will find out that at the end, there will be different masses of copper which will combine with a fixed mass of oxygen in order to form copper 2 oxide and copper one oxide. This is copper one oxide. This is copper two oxide in the ratio of what two is to one. Now we've come to the end of this preview lesson. If you want to have access to the full video, please click on the link in the description below, which takes you to the My School website where you have access to subscribe. And in the full video, we'll be looking at the last law for chemical combination. We'll be looking at stoichiometry, how we can balance chemical reaction. We'll be looking at how we can write chemical reactions between two or more compounds and so on. I believe you are enjoying this content. If yes, please don't forget to click on the like button, hit the subscribe button, and finally tap on the notification bell to keep you informed once we upload our next video lesson.